Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Louisa Lombard, an assistant professor of anthropology. She's a cultural anthropologist who studies African borderland areas where the state is largely absent and a range of actors govern. Professor Lombard's research locales, primarily the remote and little populated eastern reaches of the Central African Republic, are further marked by violent histories that continue into the present. Her main fieldwork interlocutors are among the region's men in arms, such as anti poaching guards and rebels. Today we'll talk with Professor Lombard about her new book, State of Rebellion Violence and Intervention in the Central African Republic. Welcome, Professor Lombard. Thanks, Marilyn. Let's start with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Yeah, so really the objective of this book was that. You know, this, this country, the Central African Republic, which I've been studying since 2003, really began to descend into war in late 2012 into 2013. Mm -hmm. And things got really bad there for a while. And I, you know, this is a country that has shaped me as a person and as a scholar, and I was following closely everything that was going on in the country. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell the story of this conflict, of what had been going on during the war, in a way that would draw out not just the kind of blow by blow of everything that was happening on a daily basis, but that would also bring in some of the historical and social factors that had gone into creating the situation that we found in the country, mm -hmm. and that would also do a little bit of a, a kind of structural analysis of the position of Central Africa in the world. And one of the things I realized in telling that story was that, first of all, this case of the Central African Republic actually draws out a lot of problems with the usual ways that we understand conflict mm -hmm. in Africa. And so I wanted to you know, critique some of those usual ways of thinking about conflict in Africa and also propose an alternative way of thinking about, of, of understanding and analyzing what's going on in these places. Okay. Because it seemed to me that, you know, there have been some really big shifts in terms of how conflict happens in Africa today. And one of those is the increased role of international organizations, mm -hmm. the UN, these big UN missions, NGOs, all of these kinds of, of actors. And so, it's really gotten to the point now where it no longer makes sense to try to analyze or think about conflict on the continent as if it were the product of these sort of bounded cultures of rebel groups on the one hand and then uh, you know um, government actors on the other hand and international actors on um, you know on another third hand if you happen to have that mm -hmm. many. <laughs> um, what we really need to understand is how these different actors are becoming entangled with each other mm -hmm. and developing relationships with each other that structure what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. And so that's some of what I, I try to do in the book. Um, okay. Some of the early sections of the book talk about sort of what the state has been in Central African Republic and the role of violence in it and the reasons why the kind of label of failed state um, although in some sense evocative of the kind of dysfunction that you find is analytically not very helpful in terms of understanding either mm -hmm. what has been happening or what we should do to try to fix it. Um, and then talk about specific forms of international intervention that we've seen through the years, um, disarmament programs and the like, and talk about also the specific forms of violence that um, we saw during the war and sort of where they come from and, and some of what they mean. Okay. Um, so I know you spent a lot of um, time in the field in Central Africa. How did you do your research? So this book really grows out of my research and engagement in Central African Republic since 2003. So mm -hmm. that's been a few years at this point. Right. And as a cultural anthropologist, my methods are qualitative. So I do a range of things, participant observation, interviews, um, hang out with people, participate in meetings, all of that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time um, you know, hanging out with members of rebel groups and interviewing them, going to United Nations meetings, um, all of these different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And having this perspective of having done research in the country for you know a few years at this point has made it possible for me to track both some of what has changed during that time and then also what remains the same. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to kind of look for patterns and see patterns and see what is persisting and what is changing and, and what that really means. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering as a woman um, if you were ever um, you know, fearful for yourself, especially being in the field with rebels. 
did you ever have any kind of um, um, situations that arise where you didn't feel safe? Um, that's a good question. I would say no. Um, I could have put myself into situations mm -hmm. that would have been very scary, um, but I tend to be pretty careful, mm -hmm. and I, uh, you know, do a lot of groundwork before I go anywhere, talking to different people about what the situation is like and mm -hmm. making sure that if I go, um, as a researcher who wants to ask people questions, that this will be welcome, um, that this will not be taken as an affront. And okay. I always work through chains of, of command and hierarchies uh, to make sure that people know who I am, mm -hmm. what I'm doing. You know, we have luckily here at Yale an informed consent process or an mm -hmm. ethics overview, and, and I make sure to follow all of those rules. Okay. And I've been able to stay um, pretty safe. Okay, great. Say. Now, you, you spoke of things having changed. Um, let's, let's talk about 20 years ago to today. What changes have you seen and why and also what things have stayed the same? So one of the big changes is that the region has become much more militarized. And this mm -hmm. was starting already more than 20 years ago. Um, some of the wars in the, in the region, such as in Sudan, South Sudan, in Chad, conflict in those places has been going on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really intensified. And er, it's difficult to summarize the reasons for why that's happened. But the situation that we find today is that Central African Republic, unfortunately, we don't have a map here. But mm -hmm. if you can picture it, all of its neighbors, it's this landlocked country, and all of its neighbors um, either have recently been at war or have a high levels of conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about Chad, Sudan, South Sudan. Democratic Republic of the Congo, Republic of Congo. I used to say that Cameroon was the one exception, but now Cameroon has uh -huh. seen a lot of conflict as well with Boko Haram and, and related developments. And then Central African Republic has its own conflict dynamics. So there's been this kind of ramping up of the militarization mm -hmm. of the region. And in concert with that, there has been a ramping up of kind of international interventions to try to manage and deal with these conflicts, mm -hmm. primarily by the African Union, the, the United Nations, um, but also uh, taking the form of lots of aid organizations. Are they helping at all? Uh, I think they're doing a lot to help in a kind of band-aid band type of a way. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they are really tackling some of the structural problems that exist for this country mm -hmm. or, or this region. What are the structural problems? So I think the main structural problem is that the Central African Republic is this incredibly improbable state. Mm -hmm. It's this vast, vast area with very few people um, and that has always been incredibly poor during the colonial period as today. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we expect it to kind of look like a state in this pretty typical sort of Weberian model. Mm -hmm. um, it just can't work. It won't work. Um, so we kind of, we, we infuse a number of international troops in the form of peacekeeping missions, mm -hmm. and that sort of keeps a lid on things for a while, but once they leave, the, the fundamental problem is still there, that this is this poor and very weak state that realistically is going to remain that way for a very long time, unless we really start thinking differently about what we might do in, okay. this, in this area. So what are some of the things that have stayed the same? Uh, some of the things that have stayed the same, um, that's a good question. I mean, one, unfortunately, as I said, is uh, this sort of structural problem of what the Central African Pro Republic is mm -hmm. in the world. That it is this very uh, kind of weak state, or a state that has very little administrative capacity, um, that is very poor, that is very large, that has very little infrastructure. Um, and if we went back 50 years in time, again, the region wasn't as militarized and it wasn't as much of a problem. It was kind of a sleepy backwater. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people, people liked it for that reason. But as the region has become much more militarized, it's become more and more of a problem. What are the reasons for it becoming more and more militarized? I mean, what is going on there that causes such strife versus having it be peaceful? Well, I think one factor, I mean, now I'll, I'll just talk about Central African Republic and okay. sort of leave out other countries okay. in the region. But one factor was that um, during the 1980s, uh, the country was in an economic plummet. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the proposals by different international actors, the World Bank, those kinds of, of people, was to say, well, what you really need to do is become more efficient as a, a government 
trim the civil service, stop hiring people, move to multi-party um, democracy and elections, mm -hmm. all of these good things. Um, and uh, one consequence of that was that it meant that the number of people who were able to materially benefit from the state was being constrained and couldn't be expanded. And mm -hmm. People started to feel left out. And one way that they had to protest and to say, no, we need to be taken seriously is by taking up arms. Mm -hmm. um, and so it started with army mutinies in the 1990s with members of the with soldiers saying, we're not getting paid, this is crazy, um, and then turned into a number of um, rebellions. Um, also, all taking this, this form of saying, no, we need to be taken seriously. And being taken seriously means, uh, you know, giving us some kind of material dignity right. in addition to, to everything okay. else. So that's that's one set of, mm -hmm. of factors. Right. Something that really interested me in your book is the role the occult plays. So if you could talk a little bit about that and how it's affected, um, you know, Central Africa. Yeah, so this is a big thing in, in Central Africa, and we could use a variety of different words to talk about it. The occult, witchcraft, sorcery is sort of a, a mm -hmm. local term. The problem with all of this terminology is that the moment that we hear the word witchcraft, we start thinking mm -hmm. um, pointy hats, brooms, <laughs> all of these different kinds of things. And that doesn't really describe the whole sort of world of witchcraft in okay. Central Africa. I think at the most fundamental level, when we're talking about the occult or, or witchcraft in Central Africa, what we're really talking about is that there's a sort of widespread understanding that the world consists of, there's kind of two worlds. One is visible and sensible, and the other is invisible. Mm -hmm. um, but people can still um, be active in that kind of invisible world and mm -hmm. through that invisible world can have an effect on you and, and your and your life. Mm -hmm. um, and the understanding for a lot of people in Central Africa is that basically every person has the capacity to become really powerful in terms of witchcraft mm -hmm. and use that for their own um, betterment, for their own advancement, and also to keep other people back. But most people don't do anything with it. Most people just let it lie. They don't want to get involved in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But some people work to kind of develop that capacity. And when they do, that can have very, you know, effects that people see as very antisocial. Mm -hmm. Again, such as, you know, making it so that one person gets ahead, but usually in getting ahead, somebody else, they feel like somebody else is getting behind. Mm -hmm. And so when people make recourse to witchcraft, say that it was because of witchcraft that that guy is doing so much better, in part, it's an attempt, it's a way of assigning responsibility and accountability for what people perceive to be social ills and mm -hmm. social wrongs. Okay, do, do you think people use it, um, I will say inappropriately, to um, cast aspersions on another person purposely? That definitely happens. Okay. Luckily, there are a range of different criteria that have to be, mm -hmm. to have to obtain for something to, for people to believe that accusation. Okay. Um, and so people will be accused of witchcraft and uh, it will be found that that accusation was baseless and, um, and you know, the person who accused will be the one who will lose face in that right. situation. Okay. It doesn't always work that way. You know, there are people who are accused and if you went back and looked at the evidence it, when you're in a sort of cooler headed frame of mind, mm -hmm. uh, you might think differently from when you're in the, the thick of the accusation. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some, you know, there are some parameters for this that, okay. that keep it from getting totally out of hand. Okay, help me understand when you say witchcraft, how does someone develop their witchcraft in terms of getting stronger? I mean, do they do ceremonies? What actually happens? So oftentimes it would involve apprenticing to somebody who is a known um, sorcerer and mm -hmm. learning from that person. And a lot of how what goes on there is secret. Um, okay. It's not something that those of us who want to claim that we are not witches and don't know about witchcraft, mm -hmm. <laughs> not something that we would want to know. Okay. Um, but it does involve various plants um, okay. that can have um, both medicinal and then also kind of occult functions okay. um, and a range of things like okay. that. Okay, interesting. Um, so what do you think Central Africa needs in terms of um, moving uh, the country forward? Well, unfortunately, I think that the list of things it needs are, is long, mm -hmm. um, but let me just mention two things today. Okay. One is that you know, right now in the country, we have all of these people, lots of smart people, both Central Africans and people from elsewhere, trying to work on the country's problems and mm -hmm. trying to make things better. The problem is that 
all of them have a very short-term kind of lens for their engagement mm -hmm. with the country. So if you're working for the UN, any project that you can push through is going to have a funding cycle of maybe two years, maybe three years, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only ever going to be this very short-term kind of a thing. If you're a Central African politician, for a variety of reasons, you also tend to be thinking in a very short-term kind mm -hmm. of a way. And the problem is that the problems in Central Africa are long-term problems, and they require a real long-term vision, leadership, somebody who is going to sort of take the reins and say, we're going to push this mm -hmm. forward, and think in that long-term kind of a way, and be able to implement things in a long-term kind of a way. So there needs to be some kind of fundamental rethinking of how we give assistance to this country and the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one set of problems that I think we really need to grapple with and figure out. And then I also think that um, you know there's a lot of emphasis on sort of rebuilding the state in Central Africa. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the state has never really had much of a presence mm -hmm. in in Central African Republic. It's always been very poor and hasn't been great at providing services to citizens. Um, so what if we sort of stop focusing on the state as service provider and instead start thinking about what the state might be able to do in terms of assuring that people have some very basic level of material dignity? Give people some money mm -hmm. um, and then see what they do with that, right. um, basically. I think that we need to work more uh, in the direction of a politics of distribution mm -hmm. and of giving Central Africans a kind of rightful share, you know, some, not a lot of money, but some small mm -hmm. amount that kind of is a way of creating some accountability between their leaders and, and the citizens in the country. And that also goes a long way toward just providing the kind of grist for the small scale kind of inter economic transactions right. on a village level, on a town level, that really get things going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would you like uh, a reader to take away from your book? Well, you know, in the conclusion of the book, I um, quote a Peanuts uh, comic strip that mm -hmm. was actually first quoted by a great anthropologist, Clifford Geertz, um, and he quoted it in the context of um, research that he was doing in the 1960s in what were then called the new states, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of the post-colonial world. And in this comic strip, um, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, she says, you know what the problem is with you, Charlie Brown? The problem with you is that you're you. <laughs> and Charlie Brown sort of looks at her and is like, well, what am I supposed to do about that? Mm -hmm. And Lucy says, I don't provide solutions. I just get to the, you know, diagnose the root causes of mm -hmm. the problem. And that comic strip really resonated with me because I think, you know, as an academic, as a researcher, it's easy to just kind of critique and point out the problems. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of people out there, um, people who are working in, in Central Africa now, who are faced with these really big problems and yet have to try to figure out some way to move forward, some way to, you know, make make decisions about, about how we can try to do something for this country. And so, you know, I really hope that people in reading my book, you know, one of the things I tried to do is sort of show, you know, uh, sort of readjust, realign some of the, the frameworks that we bring to bear to mm -hmm. try to understand a place like that, like this, and in doing so to provoke, provoke people to think about things differently, provoke people to perhaps come up with some different um, ideas for what we might be able to do for this country. Um, because ultimately, you know, my hope is that this book will be, you know, some kind of a testament to um, just the, the, um, the, the, the challenges and privations, privations that so many Central Africans who've been so generous with their time and, and other things with me through the years have to, have to deal with. And that'll help us perhaps, you know, that perhaps out of the critique, we will also find ways to um, perhaps assure at least a slightly more dignified future for Central Africans in the years to come. Okay, this has been very interesting. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you, Marilyn. Oh, you're welcome. For more information about Professor Lombard and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through the funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.